Hello everyone. So the PS5 release was the other day and I really hope you all are enjoying the game. I wanted to make this video because I received a question if the game is beginner friendly towards people who have never played D&D or Baldur's Gate before. And I can say already that you shouldn't worry too much. I myself had no prior D&D knowledge and I decided to learn about it from the handbook. Uh, but this is something that is definitely not required to enjoy the game. That said, I think it could enhance your enjoyment knowing a couple of things. I will try to keep this somewhat on the basic level as to not be too overwhelming, or so I hope. Since D&D is a tabletop game, it uses dice rolls, and different kinds of dice referred to as D and followed by the number of sides. We all know the cube-shaped D6, uh, then there is also D4, D8, D10, D12, D20. Everything you do in game involves a dice roll. Most of the time it happens in the background. And there's also situations where you get to roll the dice yourself, mainly in conversations, also when picking locks and so forth. In combat or while out exploring in the world and encountering something, the game has a way of representing this. And the dice results can always be found here in the conversation or combat log. There is a term tied in with dice rolls that is used very often, and that is advantage and disadvantage on a roll. So advantage on a roll means you can roll two die and pick the highest one of the two, and disadvantage means you take the lower result. There is spells for example that can cause advantage or disadvantage. Now that we have established that this is a game of dice rolls, let's have a look at character creation where all D&D adventures begin. If you are ever wondering what something means, you can press the touchpad to get the extra explanation. When starting in character creation, you are presented with several terms. Let's go over them one by one. So, a class. Uh, a class describes a character's vocation, the special talents the character possesses and what tactics you will most likely employ while exploring or fighting monsters or dealing with tense negotiations. Classes come with benefits, also called class features, capabilities that set your character apart from other classes. There are 12 classes to pick from. On top of that, there are also many more subclasses, which add a lot of variations to a class. Not even to mention that you can multi-class by mixing classes together. To give an example, the fighter is a very martial-oriented class, meaning they use melee weapons. They can choose at level 3 a subclass called the Eldritch Knight, which allows them to learn some spells. This is just as an example. Beside this, there is also the option to pick a race and sub-race. These all give different bonuses and proficiencies as well, called racial traits, and some races know even some innate magic and spells. There's also a bunch of lore and background on each of the races, but humans are the most common race in the Sword Coast. Although they live shorter lives compared to dwarves and elves, uh, there are times the game reacts on this choice as well in dialogue. If you are, for example, one of the more rare races, like a dragonborn, or if you are a race known for living in the Underdark and being cult worshippers to a spider queen that usually raid the surface world, you can expect a different attitude towards your character. So picking a class and a race will give a number of proficiencies. The combined result of these choices you will see if you pull the R2 trigger and scroll down with the D-pad. Being proficient refers to if your character can use something particularly well and get a bonus to the dice roll or not suffer a penalty for attacks, spell attacks, skills and saving throws. The proficiency bonus added to the dice roll is a plus 2 at the start of the game. This goes up every 4th level with 1 to a maximum of plus 4. This translates for weapons in a bonus to attack rolls and making use of special actions the weapon has, shown here. Wearing armor without proficiency in that armor type will impose disadvantage on all of your ability checks, saving throws and attack rolls and prevent you from casting spells. So don't do that. If we look over here, we have something called ability scores. There are six abilities that your character possesses and affects much of what your character does in game. These abilities are strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. 
So what does each of these abilities do? I will describe it here shortly. So strength increases your chance to hit enemies with strength based weapons, which by default are most melee weapons unless it's labeled as a finesse weapon. A higher strength score will allow you to jump further, lift up heavier things and carry more. Dexterity increases the chance to hit enemies with dexterity based weapons, which by default are most ranged weapons and finesse weapons. Dexterity also gives you a higher chance to move earlier in combat and affects your armor class. More on armor class later. Constitution, the amount of hit points you have. Intelligence, wizards need high intelligence to make sure spells hit enemies. Wisdom. Clerics, druids, and rangers need high wisdom to make sure their spells hit. Charisma. Bards, paladins, sorcerers, and warlocks use their charisma to cast spells. As you can see here, each ability has a score, called the ability scores. These numbers are here already filled out for you as a recommendation. You can assign a plus 2 and a plus 1. This does not mean it adds plus 2 or plus 1, but increases the cap of how much points you can spend in here. So you can freely assign ability points yourself here. The most important thing to remember about ability scores is that for every two levels above 10, which is considered being average, you gain a bonus to ability checks. For example, if you have 16 dexterity, you will receive a plus 3 to any dice roll based on dexterity. However, 15 dexterity will still net you only plus 2, so you must upgrade it one more level to get the plus 3 bonus. Then, if we look at 8 strength, we are 2 under 10, which means a minus 1 to strength checks. Luckily, at every 4th level you can choose a new feat, since the max level in Baldur's Gate 3 is only 12 and not 20 like in D&D you get to pick 3 times a feat. This is a list of extra bonuses, I'll show it here. Improve ability scores which allows you to increase an ability by 2 points or 2 abilities by 1 point. As a general rule of thumb, keep your primary ability as high as possible while not neglecting dexterity and constitution and you should be fine. Your primary ability is marked with an asterisk, but don't stress a lot over this because you can respect after you meet a certain NPC pretty early on. Since we just went over the abilities uh, our characters has, this would not mean much if we wouldn't use our abilities towards actual skills while out adventuring. Based on our ability scores you get modifiers that help you pass ability checks. So ability checks refer to a test of your ability so to speak. It's based on a dice roll plus your ability modifier and you have to check against the difficulty class, abbreviated DC. This number must be matched or exceeded to succeed. Rolling 1 always fails and rolling a 20 always succeeds. And these modifiers also affect skills outside of combat. Athletics, for example, you will gain bonuses from your strength each time you have to resist being shoved, and while Charisma will help you try to persuade the city guard into letting you pass, here's what each stat governs. So, Strength governs Athletics, Dexterity, Acrobatics, Sleight of Hand and Stealth, Constitution None, Intelligence, Arcana, History, Investigation, Nature and Religion, Wisdom, Animal Handling, Insight, Medicine, Perception and Survival, and Charisma, Deception, Intimidation, Performance and Persuasion. You get to pick what skills you have a bonus on at character creation as well. This comes from a combined choice of background, race and class. Some classes are really good at skills like Rogues, College of Lore Bards and knowledge domain clerics as an example. After we reviewed our character, we get to playing and perhaps get into some combat. There are a couple of terms here, very commonly used. So when attacking, we do attack rolls. This means the attacking character rolls a d20 and if the roll is equal or higher than the target's armor class, then the attack hits the target with the equipped weapon. This brings me over to another term commonly used is AC or armor class. And this represents how well your character avoids being wounded in battle. Things that contribute to AC include the armor you wear, the shield you carry and your dexterity modifier. So without armor or a shield your character's AC equals 10 plus the dexterity modifier. When wearing light armor, you get the full value of your dexterity modifier plus the armor value. 
With medium armor, you get the value of the medium armor plus a maximum of plus 2 from your dexterity modifier. And heavy armor, when wearing heavy armor, you gain actually no benefit from the dexterity modifier at all. So it would then be pure the armor value. And shields increase your AC by a plus 2. I thought I'd demonstrate here with a little example. So in case here, Taman attacks Astarion. Astarion, his armor class is 14, so Taman needs to roll 14 or higher to hit. He rolled a 9 for, from a d20, as it's shown here. He is proficient at the weapon he's using, so he gets a plus 2 from that one. And he has a strength of 12 or 13, because he gets a plus 1 to his strength modifier, which ended up being 12, so he missed. Then Taman did a bonus action, Pommel Strike, which does damage and has a condition. So we do two rolls here. First, if it hits, which it did with a 17 on the roll against Asterion's 14 armor class. So then there was a roll for Asterion being able to resist the condition, otherwise called saving throws. This one is based off constitution and the difficulty class is 13. Astarion rolled a 6 and has a plus 2 from his constitution which must be at 14 or 15 then. But 8 does not equal or exceed the DC so he takes on the condition dazed. So saving throws are based on your ability score. Different conditions use different attributes like dazed uses constitution. Every class has a bonus to two different types of attribute saving throws. You can find that over here under statistics in your character sheet. For Asterion it is dexterity and intelligence. Another example, Shadowheart does a critical hit against Gimbalbok here and outright one shots him. Uh, so what happened here, she rolled a 20 and that's a critical hit. Then the damage from her spell is rolled for something called the damage roll. In this case it's 8d6 dices, normally Guiding Bolt is 4d6s, but since she did a crit, you can double the amount of attack dices. So that could be at least a 6 if I roll 6 ones, and a maximum of 48 damage if I had rolled 8 sixes, which is insane. Uh, speaking of saving throws, if your character gets to 0 or less hit points, you fall unconscious. When this happens, the character will roll a d20 die to determine their fate. If the number lands between 1 and 9, this is recorded as a fail. Anything higher than a 10 will be recorded as a success. Additionally, if your character fails a death saving throw 3 times in a row, they will end up dying instead. On the other hand, if a character rolls 3 successes before 3 failures, they stabilize. If your character dies, you have to use a resurrection scroll to get them back up, which they are a bit expensive, especially early in game, so best to get them back up with a heal or a helping hand. So in combat, there are some resources to manage. There is generally one action, a bonus action, uh, sometimes class actions, movement and spell slots. So when hovering over a spell here, for example, you can see what is required for it to be cast and it will expend that resource when casted. As for movement, this bar drains as you walk further until it's empty and then you can no longer move this turn. When casting a spell, you often use an action and a spell slot, which is the ammunition for your spells. You get them back by taking a long rest. There are some basic spells called cantrips. These require an action to cast, but no spell slot. They can keep you in the fight longer if you can't take a long rest. Then there are some spells that require concentration to keep the magic active. There are things that can break concentration. Casting another spell that requires concentration is one of them. You can only concentrate at one at a time, taking damage and failing a constitution saving throw, getting downed or killed. Then lastly, I wanted to go over a term called Opportunity Tech, which is commonly used. This is actually a reaction. This is also a resource in combat. You get one reaction per turn. There are many more reactions than Opportunity Attacks, but I keep it basic here. This happens when you try to run or jump out of reach of your enemy. They get an Opportunity Attack. There are ways to prevent Opportunity Attacks, like blinding the enemy, disengaging or turning invisible to just name a few. With this I think this is enough information overload for the moment. Thank you all for watching and I hope this proved helpful. Currently the channel has over 300 subscribers and I'm very thankful to everyone who's showed their support in this way. 
See you all in the next video and bye.